Hi, Kevin at Ledoux Guitars. I'm back again today with a video in response to a question that I read in the comments section on my channel. Um, someone who watches my videos posed the question, um, how do you orient the grain in the different parts of a guitar? Now, you know, to me, that's first nature. But I thought about it and I thought, well, newer guitar makers or maybe especially uh, anybody that is not really used to woodworking or doesn't have a lot of background, that's really a valid question. So I thought I'd try and take a few minutes and go through this and see if I could clarify some of that for those of you that might not be certain about this. And I want to start with necks because there you might come to a little controversy. So I want to explain to you first that given a flat sawn section of material, uh, and to make this a little more scientific, let's presuppose that this is a, shall we say, a one by one or a two by two, a, a square cross section. If you orient it in the flat grain, stabilize it, and then stress it, um, and measure the amount of stress on it, and then rotate it so that the quartered grain is standing up, and do the same thing. The difference in stiffness is, as I understand it, very little, and sometimes maybe not much at all. Um, compare that to the fact that given the tension that's on a guitar, a six-string instrument, or even a 12-string instrument, um, whether or not that neck is quartered or flat sawn, especially when it comes to a laminated neck, I don't believe you really need to worry which way you go. Now, I think you're always safer to have the neck uh, with quartered grain showing on the back of the neck and, of course, on the fingerboard side of the neck. I think that's always a better bet. Um, and I try to do all of my necks that way, but there have been a few exceptions here and there. Uh, if you're going to use a one-piece neck, then I would recommend that you use a quarter sawn billet to do that with. But I just wanted to show you an example, specifically this one. This is a billet of white ash that I had sawn, I don't know, 12, 15 years ago. And it's clearly flat sawn. You can see by the end grain here, the way it uh, runs. It's certainly not parallel, but that circular arc across the surface there. Um, this is the flat sawn surface. Well, I took two cuts off that just like this. I'm going to kind of hold this up. They don't match the way they should, but I cut that off twice. And by folding those open, I come up with this nice quarter sawn surface here and here. And uh, it's kind of an advantage. They book match, which is a nice aesthetic. That's something that I really look for. Uh, I think that's a good way to go because you now you get stability out of the neck and you get extra strength. And when it comes to necks in particular, some of you have probably seen my video on laminated necks. Now, when it comes to the headpiece, you're going to make that headpiece out of the same billet that you make your next shaft out of. It's all one thing. And so its grain will also be oriented the same way. And it should be. You should never combine a flat sawn section with a corded section because their shrinkage and swelling rates will be different. And so there could be some problems there. The same thing with a heel block. You want, if you've got a quarter sawn section here, you want the heel block to be the same way. It's always going to benefit you if you do that. Okay, so that's simple enough with necks. Now, fingerboards, I think if you're buying fingerboards for the most part, they're pretty well quartered. But I've noticed at some of the outlets, uh, they tell you that the, you know, if you buy a second grade board, they can be off the quarter a little bit. Um, I wouldn't use a flats on fingerboard myself uh, because I'm a little bit afraid of the board curling ever so slightly. I've never, I've never had that problem with a guitar because I've never used a flats on fingerboard. But you might be willing to take that chance. It doesn't seem that the shrinkage over a lousy two and a half inches at the most would be enough to create a real problem. But I would 
stay with at least a rift, if not a fully quartered board every time. Okay, so there's necks and fingerboards. Let's go to backs and rims. Now, uh, I am not one to tell anybody you've got to have quarter sawn material for backs and rims. It's just not true. Um, here's a good example of some curly maple. This happens to be curly soft maple as opposed to hard maple. And it is clearly flat sawn. Well, that's the way the plank came to me. And that grain is very nice. You're not going to throw that away or, you know, toss it aside because it happens to be flat sawn. This will bend very nicely if you're careful with it. The, the curl grain is harder to bend. But if you're careful, it'll bend well and it will be stable enough to make a rim set. And it will make a good back set. There's no reason why you can't. By comparison, here's another soft maple rim set. And this is really cool, but this is out of a different log entirely. Um, this is out of something that was harvested maybe 10 years ago. This is out of a soft maple that I had harvested and cut to my specifications, I think, 22 years ago now. Um, look at the beautiful quartered grain in that. And look at that medullary ray fleck. That is just so pretty. And that's something that I really like. It, but it's just another character. Uh, is it going to be more stable? In these narrow widths, I don't think it's going to be more stable. Scientifically, it should be. But I don't think it's going to be an issue. Uh, in 150 guitars that I've made so far, I've used both. I have never had a problem. There's never been an issue with that. And I think if you look back at some of those real nice, slick, old Brazilian rosewood guitars, a good lot of them were never quarter sawn. They, they wouldn't look that way in the first place. Now, what about heel blocks and tail blocks? These are the blocks that, of course, go at each end of the guitar. This is where the neck is connected in, and this is where the rims come together. Uh, I make my uh, heel blocks with the grain-oriented in the same direction as the rim. It glues right here. The direction of the rim goes this way and the heel block goes the same way. The shrinkage, if there is much of any, is pretty much the same. Even though this may be a different species, that's going to make a minute difference, but it's still there. Is this quarter sawn? No, because I laminate these. These are made up out of poplar. Um, this is one layer, but there's this is another layer spline to it on the back, or excuse me, on the bottom. But as I said, I have done this now with 150 guitars, and I have never had an issue. So I don't believe you need to have uh, the grain of this standing up and down on the length of the block, so to speak. This is end grain. This is end grain. The grain is going this way. I think you're going to be just fine with that. Now, tail blocks. I'll probably catch a whole bunch of YouTube heat over this one. Uh, a lot of suppliers will sell tail block uh, blanks with the grain direction running across the short direction of the block so that the grain direction actually matches the grain direction of the rim. I don't do that. Uh, first of all, you're never going to catch me buying a block of wood to make that tail out of. That is never going to happen. I am the pragmatic luthier. Uh, I stand that grain right up and let it plywood across that rim. Um, and once again, 150 guitars, I have not had an issue with that anywhere, in regardless of species. So I guess you could argue it both ways. Uh, for those that want to comment and tell me I'm wrong, okay, go ahead. That's okay. Um, Let's take a look at some things like bridge patches. Now, I only use quarter sawn material for bridge patches, regardless of the species. And species is less important, I think, than you might think. You can use rosewood, you can use maple, uh, you can use black locust, you can use palfaro. You could put anything in there you want. I suppose you could even put a soft wood in there that is soft in texture, low density but your, your string balls are going to pull through it too fast, and that's why we want a dense wood. But uh, 
I've heard it commented uh, on another podcast from a professional Luther, even that you could use a flat sawn bridge patch if you wanted to. And my answer to that is no way. That is never going to happen, at least not in my shop. The reason is very simple. It's too easy to get this stuff quarter sawn, and it will not curl. It, it is going to shrink a few thousandths of an inch and swell. After all, you know, humidity changes. But I have seen flat sawn bridge patches curl. Not a good thing. I've even seen classical bridges that were very poorly prepared out of flat sawn material. I've seen them curl and, and come off. So with something this easy to do in good quartered material, go ahead. Not sure how to get this? Go somewhere and buy yourself a piece of two inch hard maple and cut yourself a, a bunch of these. It's simple enough to do. And your maple plank at two inches thick or thicker if you if you prefer more than two inch. As you as you saw off the edge of that, you're going to be looking at the quartered grain. Now, there's also the argument, well, the string holes go in a straight line and they're going to generate a crack in that bridge patch. Not necessarily so. If you look at this, I've drawn a straight line that as best as I could see it runs parallel to the actual grain direction of this piece of maple. And I've traced my bridge on it, my standard bridge, and I've offset my bridge to intentionally avoid having those holes run along a grain line. That's all it takes. You can, you can do that. And there's no reason, as I see it, to do anything other than quartered material, regardless of species. So let's look at bracing for a guitar. Now, I've got a back here. Uh, it doesn't matter. It could be a top or a back. This is just so that you can see in relation to the back or the top how we want to orient braces. Um, I have here a piece of bracing stock from a supplier. Um, and you can see here that the end grain is standing surface to surface pretty well 90 degrees, very close to it. This is the quartered surface right here. This is the quartered surface right here. If I rotate this, this is a flat sawn surface. This is a flat sawn surface. I don't care what brace you're, do, you're dealing with in your guitar, whether it's an upper cross strut, whether it's a patch up here, uh, the old popsicle stick that some of you may use, it doesn't matter. You want that bracing to lay down, and I hope you can see this, and I'll turn it up to the camera so that you can. Now this is oversized so that you can see it, but if this were narrow, cut narrow to be a brace, that's the way that grain is going to stand, and it doesn't matter whether it's a back brace or a brace in the top, um, and as I said, regardless of what brace it is, you want that quarter sawn surface, that quarter sawn grain to be standing upward, all right? You're going to see quarter in the top edge of the brace when it's glued down, and you're going to see those grain lines standing vertically. That's very important. You don't ever put a flat sawn brace in a guitar. I can't see any reason to do that. If one starts to split, it will easily split all the way across the guitar and come out, uh, break off. It just doesn't make sense. So always quarter sawn and make sure more than quarter sawn, quartered grain standing up on end from the, from the top or the back. Very, very important. Even if you laminate, and I'm commenting on this because you may have seen that I laminate back braces uh, quite frequently. Well, here's a little thin sliver of cedar that you can see by this surface grain. is This is flat sawn. So here's my edge grain. And I think you can probably see that in the camera. The grain is standing vertically right there. Even if I laminate my braces, I do that so that I'm looking at quartered grain. When that brace glues down, I want to look down and see that quartered grain on the top. The tangential or flat sawn grain is over here and on this side. It's extremely important no matter 
whether you're laminating braces or you're doing solid braces. Let's take a look at something as simple as linings. Now, I don't see any reason why you couldn't do a lining out of flat sawn material as well as quarter sawn, but here's what I've noticed over the years. I like to keep them quarter sawn because it's not a matter of shrinkage. Uh, a stick of wood five-eighths of an inch wide is not going to shrink and swell enough to even bother to worry about it. However, I've found that if you make this out of flat sawn grain here, uh, when you kerf them, the grain, because it's layered like so, will tend to break off at the webs. It's a little easier for it to break off. So if you've got them quartered, they hold together just a little bit better, just a little bit easier to control them. And to be honest, I think the quartered grain, if someone looks inside the instrument, I think it looks a little nicer. Now, this happens to be basswood, and this is a quartered uh, surface here, but it doesn't show much in something like basswood. But still, it seems to be a nice idea. You could go either way, but as I said, the advantage seems to be that it's got a little more integrity when you're working it as you go along. Now back reinforcement strips, uh, that is very simple. When that goes down, the grain of that needs to run at right angles to the seam that you've glued up. And that's a matter of structure. If the grain were to run in the same direction as the seam, that would come open just as easily as could be. Uh, if a crack were to start there, if that joint were to be compromised, this little thin piece of wood is going to follow suit and go right with it. So you are intentionally plywooding that by running the grain this way. Well, that means now I've got here, what, a 16, 17 inch long piece of, in this case, western red cedar. And the, the grain runs the short way as opposed to the long way. And this is, by the way, quartered surface. I don't want this to be flats on surface. I want that to be quartered as well. But that tends to be automatic because what you do is you glue your, you glue your top up. Here's the joint of a top that was glued up months and months ago. And once you get your back, excuse me, once you get your top cut out, uh, you take these leftover pieces that are going to be down in this in this region, excuse me, down in this region or in this region, the waste part, and you're going to straighten an edge and you're just going to rip uh, pieces of this right off. I make mine five-eighths of an inch wide. Uh, thickness, I vary anywhere from eh, 95, 100 thousandths to maybe 125. Uh, they're easy enough to make, and I make them every time I have leftover material from the tops. Uh, I would not make those reinforcement strips out of hard wood. Uh, by hard wood, I mean dense wood. You could make them up, I suppose, out of mahogany or maybe sapile if you're working in those kinds of things. Um, but I wouldn't make them up out of a real hard dense wood just because it's a little bit more difficult to uh, clean it down to that arch shape that we look for, or maybe if you've got facets on it or something. Uh, the softwood seems to do really, really well. All right, lastly, the uh, forgotten brace in the guitar, the bridge. Uh, I will not use anything but a perfectly quarter sawn bridge. If it's not perfectly quarter sawn, it's not going on one of my guitars. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I have seen flat sawn bridges curl. And it's just not worth the trouble. It takes too much work to make a bridge. And since we're using dense woods and exotics to make most of these, they're too expensive to have them just curl up. And then you got to peel them off and make another one. Even if I'm laminating a bridge like this, uh, every one of these layers is quarter sawn material. This happens to be cherry and hard maple under there and a bottom layer of cherry. This one happens to be okote. And as you can see, it's nicely quarter sawn. I want to offer you a final tip. Um, if you have a hardwood lumber source that offers exotics anywhere near you, uh, you need to be able to go there personally 
and look at what they have. Uh, quite often, hardwood suppliers will have shorter pieces, that is six foot long or under, and maybe even off cuts if they've been doing some work in these materials themselves. Um, and I recently found that when it comes to exotics, uh, a lot of suppliers get this stuff in and they, they'll even get short pieces in some of the various species because that's for the moment maybe all they, can, they have available. Um, this is a piece of wenge, perfectly quarter sawn. And this is a piece of palfero, also nicely quarter sawn. This piece is probably four and a half, five feet long. Uh, I go to a hardwood lumber supplier near me and I buy these. Because if you go there, you can look this stuff over and you'll find narrow pieces sometimes that happen to be quarter sawn. And if you have a bandsaw and possibly a drum sander, uh, or if you work in hand tools, uh, you can make your own fingerboard blanks and your own bridge blanks out of this stuff. And even, I mean, this stuff I think was $24, $25 a board foot. I think I paid about the same thing. Well, yeah, I paid $24 a board foot for this. So at that price, it really doesn't matter because you can get enough fingerboards and, and so on, bridge blanks out of this, that it's cheap at twice the price. And uh, after you rip out your fingerboards and bridges, as many as the piece will yield, you will usually, uh, if the piece is wide enough, you can have a strip or two left over that you can make some really nice binding out of these pieces if they're long enough to do it with. So it's a like a triple advantage. Well, I shouldn't be handling this piece of wenge with my bare hands because uh, wenge, if you don't know, and I'm sure a lot of you already do, you can get really nasty slivers from this stuff just by looking at it too hard. So I think I'll just drop it right now. At any rate, uh, I hope this video was not too lengthy and I hope it was very informative for many of you. I want to thank you again for watching my videos. And if you've not subscribed, um, I hope you'll do so. Thanks again for watching. We're very close to the holidays right now. So I want to offer a happy holidays to everyone out there in whatever way you celebrate. Thanks again.